In the next couple of videos, we'll be looking at the closing speeches from the defence and from the prosecution in the trial of Thomas Cashman. Firstly, I'll go through the defence. This will be read by Professor John Cooper, KC. He begins his closing speech with, We will focus in on the evidence, not the theory, not the fantasy. We will be submitting to you, my learned friend, has some of the evidence absolutely wrong. And if the Crown have it wrong, what hope is there? We will not be pressing the emotion button. But we will recognise straight away that this case is predicated around an absolute and utter tragedy. Nothing I have to say throughout the course of this submission takes away from that. I tell you now, if any one of you thinks that's the case, you're wrong. We are all human beings, decent human beings. If anyone would even think to the contrary, it's abhorrent. We here, as a defence team, are here to do our job, which is testing the evidence. I don't know what your experiences are of the court system. Like most people, perhaps, seeing dramas on the television. This is a real Crown Court trial. No one is going to burst through the door and say, I did it. There aren't going to be particularly dramatic moments that cause a gallery to gasp or sigh, although there have been a few on the edges. The job of the defence is simply to test a prosecution case. The prosecution bring this case. It is for the prosecution to prove their case. They are to prove it so you are satisfied, so that you are sure of the defendant's guilt. Satisfied, so that you are sure doesn't deal with babies. It doesn't deal with suspicion of guilt, or I suspect he did it. It doesn't deal with probability guilt. All of that, as a matter of law, is not guilty. We would be assured or hope that you will do your duty. In life, it's always good to put yourselves in someone else's shoes. Forget it's him for the time being. If any one of you, me, your family, your friends, my friends, my family were accused by state of something we hadn't done and brought to court to sit in the dock to face those allegations, you are entitled to that protection. That the state, with all their powers, should be told to prove your case against us, the citizen, so that the jury are sure of guilt. It protects him now. It protects you tomorrow. If they haven't proven it, it's your duty to acquit. You're not here to decide who killed this young girl, or who had the weapons, or who shot Mr Nee. What you're here to do is road test the destruction of the prosecution case against this man, to decide whether the evidence presented to you against this man stands up. If you are of the view it doesn't, wherever your emotions lie, then it is your duty as a citizen to return verdicts of not guilty. We will not shirk from making submissions on all of the evidence. It is, of course, for you to decide. What we have to submit is clinical, calm analysis of the evidence. If you are of the view that does not stand up, it is your duty to acquit. The prosecution have put Cashman in the dock. You do not have a choice about who did it. The prosecution are giving you one option. The spotlight will always be on one man. You begin your analysis of the case on a blank canvas. You put emotions to one side. Emotion does not assist in the clinical analysis you have to do. They really do need to be put to one side. We're going to give you the respect of saying it straight. I'm not seeking to be the winner of a popularity contest here. I'm seeking to help you to analyse the evidence. How can the Crown possibly say they've put emotions to one side when they finish their speech with a blend of horrific CCTV footage, as if you hadn't quite got it? Do you feel a little bit insulted by that? You're not children. You've got it. This involves the tragedy of a nine-year-old girl being shot. That was probably the third, fourth plane of it. You get it. You get the tragedy. You get the brutality. To give you respect, you don't need it played four times and then again at the end for no reason. You work it out. Why was it played again? 
to play at your emotional strings because the prosecution know they have a weak case. A weak case that means emotive images like that need to be thrown at you. A tsunami, amplified, slow motion. You can't quite be relied upon to deliver the verdict people are screaming for. With every notorious trial, with every high profile trial, there is a pressure to convict. We would submit it doesn't help having multiple playings of the shooting. You don't need to be drip fed, amplified gunshots or constant repetitions that a nine year old girl was killed. You know that. I'll give it to you straight. If you don't like me for it, so be it. It's not a popularity contest. I'm going to give it to you straight on the evidence. I sometimes say to juries, while you sit there, you are the professional judges of fact. No doubt if you weren't in the jury and I wasn't conducting this evidence, we'd be having a conversation with family or friends. Oh, did you see the latest in the news on that Thomas Cashman trial? Have a view, have a theory, get it wrong like the Crown. As we will establish, repeat the evidence inaccurately like the Crown. But we don't, because we're professionals. You are representatives of the public, but you have burdens placed upon you. Those burdens include a lack of emotion, calmly and clinically considering the evidence and being unaffected by the static of chat and discussion that goes on around you. If you wanted to be heroes of the hour, if one hears and reads the chat about this case, let's get the conviction done and dusted. We've convicted a man for killing this girl. Everyone out there is happy. The press get their story. The prosecution get their case. The police get their man. This is about getting the right man, not just pacifying the chatter and a tsunami of ill-informed interests. It's your views and your views only that matter. We ask you to be strong. If that strength means a conviction, then convict. But convict upon a proper analysis of the evidence rather than a reputation of loud gunfire. Getting evidence wrong in closing speeches and theories that don't add up. This is not a verdict about a slaying. The death of this young girl, of course it is wrong. It is about whether the prosecution is proved against a man they've put in the dock. Above all cases of its type, this is one of those few that requires us as we work together to achieve the right result. Be it guilty or not guilty, my submissions are based on doing it the right way. The prosecution are urging you for a guilty verdict. Of course I'm urging you for not guilty verdict. Our submissions are not totally partisan. If you're going to come to guilty or not guilty, please do it the right way upon analysis of the evidence. The Crown's repetition is that Cashman is tailoring his story to fit the evidence. You may think it really is a prosecution tailoring its theory to fit what evidence they have. Because again, we are going to analyse the evidence in a little more detail than the prosecution. That will assist you in evaluating the quality of the evidence you have before you. Circumstantial evidence of a particularly strong variety can assist, but that if it is strong in the first place. To put it bluntly, 0 plus 0 equals 0. The circumstantial evidence has to have some quality to it. What we argue is, yes, the Crown's case is based on circumstantial evidence. But that is weak and of no assistance to you whatsoever and in many respects defies logic. Let me give you an example. The Crown's case is obviously based on Cashman being a hitman, an executioner. It's based upon planning and preparation, no motive, no evidence of working with anyone. He is nonetheless a hitman. If the Crown is suggesting this level of care, the level of dotting the I's and crossing the T's, how does this work? The prosecution give examples of Journey 3, where Cashman can see Joseph Nee in his white van. The prosecution can conclude Joseph Nee is outside the premises, because his white van is there. If you're a hitman, bear with me, and you find your target and you've been looking for your target all day, the Crown are suggesting all these routes the Citroen is taking, scoping. You as a hitman find your target, got him. What do you do? What you don't know 
You say, excellent, I'm going to have a quick trip around the neighbourhood and go home for tea. This is the Crown's case. It's on our point of defying logic. A desperation. There it is. Cashman apparently spots in his van. Gets him where he wants him. He'd stay within sight distance of that van to wait for Need to get out of the house. In driving back to his own, who's to say that van isn't going to drive away two minutes later? It doesn't make sense. What is the point of scoping someone if the Crown's case is correct? Then drive away again. 35 minutes past eight, why not wait again? Cashman has spotted Joseph Nee. After spotting Joseph Nee's vehicle, what does Cashman do? Drive away again to Mab Lane for 20 minutes. Again, the same point. However nicely it fits to the narrative, that doesn't make sense. What was to stop Joseph Nee getting into that van after he'd gone to Mab Lane and driving away? What a beautiful opportunity it would have been. That's the moment he would have shot him. When they find their target, they wait. They don't go for tea or whatever. The Crown's case really is that CCTV and the unnamed witness, in many respects, the Crown has spent much of their time focusing on the moments and CCTV. So do we. We do not shirk away from the CCTV, of the moments of Thomas Cashman on the CCTV, as Hitman scoping, finding Mr Knee and having him where he wanted him, then leaving him there. Might it be suggested Cashman wasn't quite in their mind for murder? What might a man in the mind for murder be in? He either sees a person coming out and shoots them, or follows them. He's scoping the joint for hours. What's the point of finding him and driving away? If he's the it man, he'll follow him to wherever he goes. You're ready to follow him, you don't find your victim, then go for tea. Why does he behave this way? Because he's not the hitman. If he was the hitman, he'd have stayed there. He'd have either stayed there until Nee came out of the house and shot him, or followed him, so that at least he didn't have to find him again. It's common sense. Emotion dictates. Let's get Cashman. There's a craving for conviction generally here. The mood music out there, it needs someone for the murder of this girl. We need the right man. Society needs a prosecution to get the right man and to prove they've got the right man. That's you, society. None of us want the wrong man. It's a hard job. Probably the hardest job, probably one of the hardest cases for some years. So easy to wipe the board and convict him. So easy to do that. Members of the jury, the evidence, not case theory, not imagination, not hope. The Crown dropped into their speech an imperceptible drop you may or may not have heard about Craig Brine. Who did you not hear from? I could say Joseph Nee. Who did you not hear from? What about Joseph Nee? The Crown did drop that one in. If they can drop it in, so can we. But our answer generally is, we base this one on evidence, not who you did not hear it from. Going back to the scoping allegation, something the prosecution missed, this is to do with Thomas Cashman on the corner of Berryford Road. Why did Thomas Cashman make his way on foot in a change of clothing via Snowbury Road? He had been thwarted because Joseph Nee had gone. He had no option but to turn around. That's at 3.56pm. They wouldn't make the mistake, this hitman, of leaving him unattended later on in the day. There's him being thwarted at 3.56pm and seeing he's gone. Common sense is very important. Use your common sense because the evidence is inadequate. We ask you to use your common sense for more constructive reasons. Common sense about whether this man, as a hitman, would leave someone unattended after they've been found. We submit the prosecution haven't spotted it. They haven't shown you the CCTV of it. Nothing in there about where Kevin Dunn lived. Nothing in the prosecution's opening about it. Even when they showed you the CCTV, Kevin Dunn appearing from his home 
at just the time Cashman was looking down the street. He may suspect the prosecution missed that. It took the defence to bring it out. That's an example of the role the defence play in these trials. We're not the devils incarnate. Neither are we here to throw a veil over the evidence in this case, more so than ever, because the prosecution got the evidence wrong. They even got the interpretation of the evidence wrong. They missed Kevin Dunn. They didn't spot it. The defence did. We brought it to your attention. If we hadn't, the prosecution wouldn't have done because they hadn't spotted it. It's our job to make sure you have all the evidence in front of you to make that decision. That's what we do. It's not as glamorous as people make out. It's quite unglamorous the hours we spend at our desks going through papers. If the prosecution have missed something, we don't. We don't want you to walk out of this courtroom and in fairness, neither do the prosecution. Having delivered a verdict of guilty or not guilty, then learn something later that counteracted the evidence in court. If only we'd known, if only we'd been told. It's the job of all of us. In this case, it was the defence doing their job. Let's look at the evidence. Let's look at Berryford Road evidence. Cashman walks from the corner, looks down the road and walks off. He was going to shoot Joseph Nee, thwarted and quickly walked away. They're telling you what's on that side of the road, Joseph Nee. They're not telling you what's on this side of the road, close by. There is Kevin Dunn's car, but it gets worse. What it took the defence to have to show you, at the time he was looking down the road, he wasn't looking at that car. You saw the feet, the body of Kevin Dunn, standing near his car. The defence brought you that, not the prosecution. Make of it what you will, but the defence brought you that. It's not tailoring the evidence. This is an example of the other way round, you may think. What the defendant says about looking down the street and seeing Kevin Dunn, he is going to go into his brother's house to deal or leave drugs. His brother wouldn't be happy about it and he goes away. Imagine if we hadn't shown you that. I'd have a wager with myself. I bet there would be at least half of you, if not all of you, who thought Cashman is clearly looking down that road looking for Joseph Nee. Why else would he be? At this point, Mr Cooper points at the dock and says... What was it the Crown says about him tailoring, lying, taking advantage of the evidence? We are talking about a very serious crime here. Can you imagine what you might have been thinking if we had not shown you that? I'd have thought the same as you. Imagine how you would have felt leaving this trial with that being the only game in town. For the Crown to suggest, you can tell that what Cashman was looking at by the way he moved does not bear analysis. You are not mind readers. How does a person react when they see an individual who is not supposed to know you're handling drugs? If it was his brother, he'd have thrown his hands in the air and said, Oh God! It shows the desperation the Crown have that seeps through the evidence in this case. It is, and I will ask you to remember this expression, what we will call an over-interpretation of the evidence by the Crown. An over-interpretation of the evidence so it fits their world view. It is a Cinderella syndrome. We will force this evidence into a shoe that doesn't fit and play the banging video a couple of times. At this time, Mr Cooper goes on a short break. Next, Mr Cooper comes back in and so does the jury. Mr Cooper resumes his speech. Unfortunately, when Mr Cooper accused the prosecution of making a mistake, he has also made a mistake himself. He corrects himself to say, that the prosecution did identify Mr Dunn's address in the agreed facts. He goes on to move to the prosecution's claim that Cashman got rid of his clothing. Mr Cooper says, The getting rid of the trousers. Where are these trousers? The suggestion is made this was done to avoid getting into trouble, to avoid being linked to this tragedy. That sounds good, doesn't it? But it doesn't sound so good when two days later, he's still wearing them. It's not quite clear what the Crown are saying here. 
Cashman is so concerned about these trousers because they may be a problem. And yet two days after, there he is. Two days later, he's wearing them. If he does get rid of them, it's pretty late. It's going back to the Crown Cinderella Syndrome. Squeeze it in and make it fit. Here we now have, squeeze it in with the trousers. There he is, wearing them two days later. Every little opportunity being taken by the Crown to overinterpret the evidence. So much so, it becomes unreliable. He's stopping to talk to the two women to keep scoping. Or might it be the defence's version? He's stopping to talk to two women to keep scoping. Or might it be the defence version? He knew these two women and was having a chat with them. Every single thing he does, the Crown are over-interpreting which distorts common sense. Let's submit to you on the ultimate distortion of common sense. So much so that it disappears upon its own end. This is fundamental if this man is the hitman. Why does he need to scope Joseph Knee in the first place? Why? What would this defendant have that would be invaluable to him? All this driving around, none of it necessary for a number of reasons. Firstly, the defendant knows where the knee's mother lives, the place where the knees go to regularly. He knows where the three brothers live. He was with Joseph Knee only the day before. On Mr McHale's evidence, on a previous occasion, they met at Mr McHale's house, one of the brothers. The defendant knew where to find Joseph Knee, most likely at his mother's home or at his home. Why, if this man is the hitman, is he doing any of this scoping anyway? What is more likely? That this man is the hitman? Who knows where Joseph Knee lives? Who knows where his mother lives? Nonetheless, he goes through this complex exercise of scoping it out. Or it's not him. It doesn't make sense. That was it. We've got our man. Forget gunshot residue, lack of DNA, all that. Forget no one identifies him at the scene. Forget the fact that he's six foot. One says he's five foot seven and of slim build. Looks about 18. We'll return to the identification evidence. Forget all that. Thomas Cashman is seen in the area, maybe doing something shifty. Overinterpret the evidence to fit the narrative you have decided is the truth. The Cinderella Syndrome. The one that will deliver the conviction and society will be at peace. A book closing moment on this tragedy. Our submission is not to close the book on the wrong person. It may make people feel comfortable, but that's not closing the book. It might make for good headlines for a few days, but that's not closing the book. Life is messier than that. Very rarely in life do we have the conclusions like at the end of a two hour movie and then the credits come up. The script has got to be right first. The evidence has got to be right first. Before that happens. Thomas Cashman fundamentally doesn't need to scope. He does need to drive around the neighbourhood with his dirty business. I'm not cheerleading for his disgraceful behaviour. I'm certainly not. If you think I would, then you'll be disappointed. If he thinks I would, then he'll no doubt be disappointed. I am presenting it to you as a real life explanation. The defence in a Crown Court trial have to prove nothing. We've tried to prove things. We've tried to establish things. If there is doubt, it is exercised by the defendant's behaviour. Mr Cooper now moves on to the GSR, the gunshot residue evidence. He says, the gunshot residue evidence in this case takes you no further. Zero plus zero equals zero. Does it help you? You heard the evidence off the expert. You heard a league table of gunshot particles, single particle, one particle, low level, two to five particles, medium level, six to 15 particles, high level, 16 to 50 particles, very high level, 50 plus particles. You're working with a low level amount of particles. You're working with the most common type of GSR material. Do you agree that the discovery of the high concentrations of residue will suggest that the contamination item or person was close to the discharge of the firearm? The answer was yes. If you're in close proximity for the discharge of weapons, 
there is likely to be a high concentration of gunshot residue found on you or the clothing. This hitman had two firearms. Consider whether this is consistent with the defendant being the gunman. Do you agree when two objects come into contact with each other, an exchange of materials can take place? The answer was yes. Do you agree it is not possible to assess how the two particles of GSR have been acquired? Answer no. Agreed as if it was with that proposition. That's a gunshot residue evidence. The residue is a cloud of spray. A fine debris brought out to produce wherever it may remain. When the Crown reply upon this piece of evidence as being there to assist you, it could not be more weak. The words used are slightly more support. Most common residue, except more on clothing, if in close proximity to the firing of that clothing. All of this is absent as far as the gunshot residue is concerned. The question that remains, how could it have got there? These are not, we emphasise, the jogging bottoms of the defendant. He borrowed them for the reasons we will develop later on. You know what we say about a potential way in which the expert is not disagreeing with? The gunshot residue could have gotten those jogging bottoms. So Mr Cooper now references an earlier shooting, the one where the unnamed witness was present. He says, she said this, it weren't long ago, I seen someone else get shot, five or six shots. That was heartbreaking, helping this fella. There she is effectively telling you she was in close proximity, that five or six shots have been fired and that she was virtually standing by his head. All of those circumstances we submit account for potentially secondary transfers of gunshot residue. It was a small amount, which indicates however it got there, it did not get there by someone discharging a gun. Therefore, it lends itself to the suggestion of someone being in close proximity to someone who was shot. These items quite easily could have been carrying the gunshot residue. There is no dispute that this incident took place. There is no dispute that she was there soon after the incident and closely involved in giving assistance. There is no dispute that at least five shots were fired. There is no dispute that the individual who fires a weapon is more likely to have a high concentration. If he'd been handling two guns and discharged two guns, it would have been all over him. Although I have been criticised in the prosecution for that repetition of gunfire, let us use it to the defence's advantage. You saw the firing of those guns. You saw how the gunman was holding them. Would you not have expected there to be far more GSR found on the shooter than there was on him? There it is again, common sense. Not to ask as stuffing where the evidence doesn't exist, but to act as a guidance to you as to the quality of the evidence. Use common sense to road test this evidence. The Crown rely upon clothing the defendant was wearing, that it identifies him as the shooter. Not only is this clothing popular, as the Crown elicited from the expert, she told you it was their bestseller. As for Mr McHale revealing his t-shirt, you may think he wouldn't have had his top over it. He wouldn't have had to be asked by me to lift his top up. Might it be the reason he had... Might it be the reason he had that t-shirt on him was because the item is popular? What's the point in coming into court with your top on and not showing it? The Crown assumed the worst. It all gathers in the same narrative. You can't trust Mr McHale. He's a liar. You rely on the unnamed witness, who is a liar and has admitted lies. Mr McHale's a liar, although you can't establish any lies. He's coming deliberately dressed in a t-shirt but you can only trust the unnamed witness who blatantly is a liar. Do you remember when the Crown referred to their main witness in this case? You'd imagine it would be. You could only rely on this woman, a woman of truth and honesty. How do they describe her? Or does this not sum up, in a nutshell, the level of the Crown's case? She's fundamentally honest. What does that mean? Dishonest here and there. Is she fundamentally truthful, but a liar? When you judge her, judge her how the Crown places her. Start with the Crown's thoughts about her. 
They submit to you that she is fundamentally honest. Not honest. Convict him, if you will, on fundamentally honest. I raise that in the sense that Mr McHale being criticised for his t-shirt. It's a popular brand and he had to be asked by me to lift his top up. He had to be asked by me to show his trainers. It was hardly a stage managed craft job. If he'd been there deliberately trying to show these things off, it would have been more slipstream than that. Did he go off to the shop and buy these items so he could show them to you? Over interpretation of the evidence? McHale wears the trainers and t-shirt which are popular. McHale is a liar. It shows you how the prosecution for all the fire and brimstone of the CCTV, for all the scoping allegations, are fundamentally in trouble when it comes to the evidence which actually proves their case. While we're on the subject of t-shirts, it is the Crown's very bold submission that the blood on the t-shirt Mr Cashman is supposed to be wearing during the garden hopping was caused by an injury during the course of that garden hopping. If there were impediments to climb over, he did it, and maybe injured himself in the process. It's a pimple sized area. If he had been garden hopping, there would be more than a pimple scratch. You might have been of the view that it's surprising there was nothing on the outside of his t-shirt. The defendant said, wait a minute, when I was arrested, early September was it, I was examined head to toe. The only injury were carpet burns on my knees as a result of my arrest. What is it the Crown is suggesting? The pimple sized scratch is a result of his garden hopping? Not a single scratch, bruise or graze? Over interpretation of the evidence? There it is again, Cinderella syndrome. Mr Cooper now resumes his speech. We will carry on analysing the evidence. I will carry on giving you the respect you deserve, having been here for nearly four weeks. No sound bites, no headlines, no multiple playing of videos. The hard work, hard work for me, but even harder work for you. I wish I could make it easier. I wish I could set it to music or whatever. It's going to be harder work when you retire to consider your verdicts. I know you will consider both sides of the arguments. The evidence cries out for your not guilty verdicts because the prosecution have not proved their case. Moving on to the jury duty, it is the most important civil duty any person has in times of peace. The job you've been given by chance in a case like this. You have to exercise that icy, steely professionalism as the judges of facts. We're standing here dealing with the evidence, without pyrotechnics. It tells you we are not afraid of the evidence. We, on the defence, are not afraid of the evidence. We don't need gimmicks to avoid the evidence. We want you to use your common sense, not fill in the gaps, but to analyse the evidence. That's what we carry on doing today. It was left to the defence to produce to you the Kevin Dunn images. The prosecution didn't even find it. This made great headlines. Let it not be said the wool is being pulled over the eyes of you by the defence. My observation are on the quality of the police investigation and how deep that was. Shouldn't the investigators have seen this video, logged it and given it to the defence without us having to ask for it? When we're talking about having the wool pulled over our eyes, it's a prosecution soundbite that sounds good out there on the streets. You're in here doing your professional job. We're interested in the evidence. Ask yourself this question. Who actually in this case has presented the evidence to you? When the prosecution assert there's a cut on the t-shirt caused by the gunman garden hopping. Which team was it that analysed the t-shirt in front of you? Which person told you he was examined head to toe a few days later with only friction burns on his knees? That was true. Which team is giving you half the story? The story that suits them? 
the side which is saying to you, let's fit the evidence to my story. Is that the defence? Or is it the defence that are going to give you the full picture? The temerity to even ask you to consider it's a defence pulling the wool over your eyes is astounding. These suggestions are easy to make because the defendant is sitting in the dock. Probably one of the most hated people in the country. Convict him. Let's move on. Close the book. Members of the jury, we ask you to quality control what the prosecution are suggesting to you. It's pulling the wool over your eyes, code for, we don't have an answer to your defence. What that usually means is, we don't have an answer to the defence. It's a matter for you. It's a clever rouse by the defence. So clever it might be believable. Not because it's true. It's just sowing the mood music with you. It's just suggesting that the prosecution had their theory about the man scoping the area. Remember, he didn't need to. He's finding the van, then walking away for tea or whatever. Don't think about those little problems. Move on. Dismiss it. Don't even think about it. It's frightening for the prosecution to think that you might think about it. You might say it might have some merit. This man accused of one of the most heinous crimes for some time might hold the front page, be telling the truth. But he's pulling the wool over your eyes. Move on. Use your common sense when you think the defendant might be getting somewhere with his defence. We ask you to consider the evidence. It was boldly put out there that this defendant ran across the garden and injured himself. CCTV cameras in the area, not one of them shows this defendant garden hopping. It's one of two things. One, we shiver even to say that the police didn't do their house to house inquiries and the police didn't ask all these houses for CCTV footage or any other form of evidence apart from one gentleman who said his trestle was damaged. One shudders to think the police didn't do house to house inquiries all of these houses. One assumes they did. We submit it would be beggar's belief that there wouldn't be at least one camera in the whole of that area. We say many, many more than one. If it wasn't asked for, what does that say to you about the quality of this investigation? No one shows garden hopping, particularly not by him. As Mr Cooper says this, he points to the dock and points at Thomas Cashman. Let's use our common sense to quality control and road test the prosecution evidence. Our job here is not to discover who tragically killed Olivia. Our job here together is to find out whether the police, the investigation, the prosecution have presented enough evidence to you that he did it. That's your job. It's no less important. Mr Cooper then goes on to describe the case against Thomas Cashman as a mad circus that is a prosecution. He then says, it's so on itself, it starts submitting its own world view. The real world doesn't sustain the argument. It's almost as if the investigation has become obsessed with believing every single thing in this case. It all relates to the guilt of Thomas Cashman. Does any CCTV show him going to the unnamed witness's house on the night of the 22nd? I'm asking you to look at the evidence. However tedious it may be, I'm actually doing it old school. Let's sit down and talk about the evidence. The way he behaved on August the 22nd was just how he behaved on any other day. Would a person who shot a little girl be behaving like that the day after? The prosecution go on with the hood being used. Just because you're wearing a hood, it's suspicious. People can put hoods up because it's raining or cold. You don't have to be Carol Kirkwood. You don't have to be a weather person to say it on those images to see it's raining. Or that in the later image, it has stopped raining. You can even see the drops coming off the hedge post rainstorm. It was raining. He had a hood up and he was covering his face because it was raining. 
A little later, he wasn't when it had stopped raining. When you analyse it, look at it carefully and think about it, it does not stand up to our submission. Moving on to the identification evidence. There is absolutely none. You know the defendant is six foot. There's a difference you may think between five foot seven and six foot. I'm five foot nine, he's six foot. Big difference between us. And yet what you have from the witness, Andrew Tefler, is a shooter was five foot eight, short and skinny, and had the figure of an 18 year old male. There is no identification that matches this man. The shooter is five foot eight. Definitely short and skinny. This is the prosecution evidence. There is no evidence at those critical moments of identification of this individual. The prosecution is no more than a theory out of control. There is no forensic evidence to link Thomas Cashman to the home of the Corbells. No fingerprint evidence. No definitive evidence whether or not gloves were worn at all. A higher possibility that the gunman would have left fingerprints. No motive. Not that the Crown have to prove motive. But it always helps. No motive for Thomas Cashman to be involved in the shooting in any way of Joseph Nee. No evidence of any lead-up communications. You may think not just when the phone wasn't being used, but nothing pre-August the 17th, which in any way is worthy of bringing to you to show any form of conspiracy, conversation or discussion. As far as he is concerned, he was speaking to Joseph Nee perfectly, amicably, the day before. You may ask yourselves this. Why not shoot him then, the day before? Why not do it then, if it was Cashman? There is a massive hole in the Crown's case in terms of common sense. We don't leave it there. The evidence don't leave it there either. Mr Cooper goes on to another agreed fact in the case. As of August 22nd, 2022, Joseph Nee and members of his immediate family had their enemies. As of August 22nd, 2022, Joseph Nee and his members of his immediate family had their enemies, plural, not enemy, enemies. He goes on to another greed fact. In an incident which occurred in March 2018, Joseph Nee was shot by somebody. The Crown do not suggest Thomas Cashman was responsible for or involved in the incident. A previous attempt on Joseph Nee by someone, not Cashman, and nothing to do with Cashman. Joseph Nee had his enemies. Joseph Nee has the following previous convictions recorded between 2001 and 2018. Conspiracy to supply controlled drugs. Possession with intent to supply controlled drugs. Possession of controlled drugs, burglary, theft, aggravated vehicle taking, theft of or from motor vehicles, associated driving offences and a public order offence. Joseph Nee has his enemies. The Nee family had their enemies. Join those dots with a lack of evidence in this case. Ask yourselves when Cashman says it wasn't him, might and that's all it has to be, Cashman be telling the truth. It wasn't him. Joseph Nee and his family did have enemies. It's an agreed fact. When Tommy Cashman says to you, it wasn't me, it must have been someone else. That's not pie in the sky. It's based on fact. He had enemies. As at August 22nd, 2022, on the day of this tragedy, Joseph Nee and the members of his immediate family had their enemies. Please take away with you, in your minds, this admission. It is central to this defence. It is telling you, and it's agreed by the prosecution, that on the night that the trigger or triggers were pulled on Joseph Nee, he had enemies. Enemies, plural. You know, therefore, on the night the triggers were pulled, there were multiple people who were his enemies. Not had an enemy, but had enemies. You know, therefore, at that moment, Thomas Cashman is alleged to have pulled those triggers. Joseph Nee had enemies. Enemies. There are others. There are others. Therefore, the defence say that would have wanted Joseph Nee dead. He had enemies. This is not common sense. 
and it is not certainly pulling the wool over your eyes. This is an analysis of the evidence. There is no evidence presented by the prosecution of any bad blood between Thomas Cashman and Joseph Nee. There is no evidence presented of any blood between Thomas Cashman and any of the Nee family. Quite the contrary. There is unchallenged evidence that he was amicably talking to Joseph Nee the day before. You can take it as accepted, otherwise it would have been challenged. There is evidence that on occasions another brother had been with the defendant and they were laughing and joking, talking amicably. He knew where Nee's mother lived. On all occasions, his relationship with them was amicable and friendly. That's the evidence. He gave it on oath. Where is the evidence of bad blood, of animosity, of anything which might lead to the idea it was this man rather than the enemies of Joseph Nee? What it crystallises down to is this. There is no evidence that this man was an enemy of Joseph Nee. None. No evidence at all to say he was an enemy of Joseph Nee. He was with Nee the day before and it was perfectly amicable. Despite that, the moment these triggers were being pulled, Nee did have enemies. It was quite frightening in a case like this. The static you hear out there and the talk and the chatter and what you may have thought when this trial started. It's frightening to think where we would be if it wasn't for the evidence. The evidence is a protector of the innocent. I'm not putting Cashman to you as an angel. Far from it. I don't have to like him, neither do you. We'll never talk again after this trial. We're not mates. It's a matter of doing my job, and you doing your job. Let's face it, when you first sat here and you knew the trial you were doing, you looked at him and you thought scum. That was before you heard the evidence. That's a journey juries go on sometimes. It ain't finished yet, because I've still got more evidence to address you on here. He then continues on the evidence of Nicholas McHale. Let's do spot the difference. You can't rely on the prosecution's interpretation of the defence evidence. Nicky McHale said he went out after the match for a cigarette. That he was stressed because his team had lost. Nicky McHale told you he was laughing and joking with Thomas Cashburn across the garden. Nicky McHale told you he goes into his house and Tommy Cashman goes into Craig Bryan's. He told you on oath about five to ten minutes later, Craig Bryan knocks on asking for a lift and Paul McCarthy takes him. On a couple of occasions, he saw Thomas Cashman smoking a spliff. The prosecution submits to you that Nicky had got it all wrong. It was not Thomas Cashman who knocked on the door first, it was Craig Bryan. You will be guided as to whether what the prosecution said to you was accurate or inaccurate. Paul McCarthy said about five minutes after the match, Craig Bryan knocked. We submit to you the prosecution completely forgot, misunderstood and confused that evidence. What he submitted to you on that was palpably wrong. This is what Nicky McHale says. He went out after the match after a cigarette. He's laughing and joking with Thomas Cashman. About five to ten minutes later, Craig Bryan knocks on, asking for a lift. Nicky carries on watching the pundits and sees Tommy Cashman outside smoking a spliff. Nicky didn't get it all wrong. The evidence is clear from Nicky McHale. After a small break, the defence speech continues. Mr Cooper will now address the evidence of the witness who cannot be named. There's someone I have not mentioned up until now says John Cooper. He refers to the witness and he says, Fundamentally telling you the truth, according to the Crown, you've seen her. Remember when she started giving evidence, clutching the Bible to her heart, it was a very dramatic moment. A woman who lied and lied and lied again to the police. There's no fundamental telling the truth there. It was downright lies. The Crown are very forgiving over her lies. The developing timing of her anger and vitriol was all coming to a peak in August 2022. There had been bitterness and resentment, festering for a much earlier period of time. But it was all coming to a crux and a pinnacle. 
No CCTV evidence. Nothing to suggest he was near her house. Look at the sort of expressions she used. I promise you this is a whole truth and nothing but the truth. Mr Cooper quotes the unnamed witness. He continues and says, No Bible to crush her heart, but it sounds very impressive. Lies. Again, he reads from her police interviews. I would say every last detail, he quotes her. He goes on to say, lies. She went on to lie about the clothing evidence, to lie about where she was in the house and for how long, and what she heard until she was tripped up over the fitness app. Consistent lies about her relationship with Thomas Cashman. This fundamentally honest woman. He again reads from one of her statements where she says, no sexual relationship, 100%, I've told you everything. Thomas Cashman is just a friend. He tried it on with me and I told him to fuck off. I love Paul's bits. I'm not going to lie. Lies. She finally says I'd fuck Paul and I want it to be Tommy. Then we heard more. She would send Tommy Cashman pictures of her arse in her words. And of course you may think, it may become more intimate than that. She says she did not speak to Tommy Cashman since she came back from holiday. Lies. Throughout, to the police, lies to you. This is a woman capable of telling lies when it suits her. If it is true, it must be one of the most traumatic experiences. And yet what happens the following day? She went to go and get her nails done. She went to the gym. I suggested, after all you'd been through, the first thing you'd think about is getting your nails done or going to the gym. She shouted back at me, that's the way I deal with things. Caught out, didn't think. It's not the way she deals with things. It's a small bit of evidence which helps establish whether she's telling the truth or trying to ruin this man. Would anyone have gone on their next day and gone and had their nails done and gone to the gym? If the trauma of what she was telling you was the truth rather than damn right lies, the criminal trial's small moments can help shine a light on the truth. We submit to you that it's just a small moment in a number of moments in this trial which give you an idea as to where the truth might lie. Mr Cooper then highlights a message sent by the witness to a friend. He reads it out and says, It's time to ruin him like he's done me. My relationship, everything. He continues to say, A woman angry, a woman bitter. A woman feeling she had been used and thrown away. Just as I'm not going to stand here and be a cheerleader for his obnoxious cannabis dealing, nor am I going to be a cheerleader for his morals. It was a sordid relationship. We're not here as a court of morals. I'm absolutely sure they're not your morals or the way you conduct yourselves. We're not here to judge that. Neither am I here to support or condone that behaviour. The reason I'm raising this with you is to establish the motive and reasons for why she would have been so angry. It was clear that her plan was that they'd go to Marbella him and her. He would leave Kaylee, who he became engaged to, in 2015. That was never going to happen. Tommy Cashman, some might say, used her as much as she used him. I make no judgement on either of them. That is what's going on. Some might say, both as bad as each other. She read into it far more than he was prepared to deliver in reality. Mr Cooper then continues to tell the jury the relationship had come crashing down around the witness's ankles by August last year. He says, Never ever was Tommy Cashman going to leave Kaylee for her. He was never going to play any meaningful part in her life. That obviously was not what she wanted to hear. On the subject of a sexual relationship with the defendant, he tells you of that moment when passion overcome them in the kitchen. Semen or juices produced by one or the other went over the t-shirt and onto the jogging bottoms. Produced the stains. The defendant did not want to be found out by Kaylee because he feared the consequences. That, of course, is the catalyst in the changing of the clothes. You had the reward, the spectre of this case. She says she jokingly asked would she be entitled to the money. 
she was well aware of the possibility of rewards in this case. She accused me of putting words in her mouth. She was desperate for money. She says her partner, Paul Russell, owed 25000 to Thomas Cashman, a real drug debt. It was very clear that Thomas Cashman was going to get the money he was owed. Another motive, you may think, for getting Cashman out of the way. He then refers to the jacket seen worn by Cashman, but not the gunman. What is the suggestion that he took it off as it identified him? He left on his joggers as luminous as Blackpool illuminations. Or is it simply not Thomas Cashman? They were popular items of clothing. The trainers were popular items of clothing. He then refers to one of Thomas Cashman's no comment interviews. It would be foolhardy to go to a doctor who suggests you have your appendix out and say no. It would be equally foolhardy to go to a solicitor and not accept their advice. Mr Cooper now addresses the defence case and Cashman's evidence to the jury. He says, He was a high-level drug dealer with cannabis. His behaviour on the night and day was in no way different to his behaviour the day before and to some extent the day after. He produced an alibi witness, which may be of the view, regardless of the area he came from and his views on the police, was a truthful alibi witness. How do we assess where truth lies? What are the telltale signs of a person who is lying? They certainly don't make concessions which undermine their evidence, which dilute their evidence. Mr McHale told you that on one occasion, at 10.55, the defendant knocked on his door. Not before. He was also asked by the prosecution whether on other occasions he saw Tommy Cashman and the length of time he saw Tommy Cashman. McHale was very clear. It wasn't a constant eyeball of him all the time. What he says means Cashman couldn't have been committing the offence in any event. How easy would it be to say he was in the house all of the time? He came round and watched the pundits. We sat together, chatted together. Yes, he did knock on my door before 10.55 and he was in my house. Alternatively, I went out my house and stood with him in the garden for a significant period of time. That's a lying alibi. An alibi where someone comes forward and exaggerates. When you assess Nicky McHale's evidence, assess it not only on what he said, but what he didn't say. He did not over-egg the pudding. He gave evidence with a cross-examination which was consistent with the defendant, which could not have been planned or rehearsed, but smacked of the truth. We submit Mr McHale was a witness of truth. There is no evidence to suggest he's been rewarded or provided with any form of coercion to be here. He's someone you can rely on. After another short break, the closing speeches continues for the defence. Mr Cooper again wants to make a point of clarification. Speaking on the unknown witness, he says, the clothing Thomas Cashman came to the house on August 22nd was taken by Paul Russell to Snowbury Road, and yet we see Thomas Cashman wearing the same trousers two days later. We submit that cannot be right. I had to encapsulate before you a wealth of evidence which supports a case of TC. We had to start from real ground zero in this case. You know why I say that? Because the attitude, the understandable initial attitude of everyone towards a person accused of the crime, is a person who crawled out from underneath a stone and indeed the person that did not crawl out from underneath a stone. We've done our job now. Whatever your verdicts are, we now require you to do your job. Carefully, without emotion, without fear, not a favour as to what your verdict may be. If you're of a view someone else might have been responsible for this, that Joseph Nee had enemies, if this man convicted of whoever really did it gets away with it, be satisfied so you are sure. You will close the investigation and if you are satisfied, so be it. You have given up a lot of time. You will listen to each other in your deliberations. You will take into account the views and opinions of your colleagues. If you agree with them, that is all good. We ask you to be true of your individual views at the end of your deliberations. Whether you agree or disagree, out of careful analysis, 
stick to your views. It's too important to do otherwise. The defence have done their best now to show you the evidence for what it is. We ask you to carefully look at it and conclude that this defendant is not guilty. And this concludes the closing speech for the defence.